I'm going to talk about a number of projects that I've been leading or part of in the Pacific, um, just as, a, I guess, case studies of how we are using science to inform adaptation at regional scales, but also at local scales. All of these projects have actually been done under C2O, Coast Climate and Oceans, um, but I am adjunct at the university, just never actually here, <laughs> so, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, so a lot of this started way back in 2004 when we looked to do a large regional assessment of vulnerability of the Great Barrier Reef to climate change, looking at ecosystems, um, the species that they support and the people that use those ecosystems. And that was followed very quickly. Um, the year that the GBR assessment was released, we started one for the whole Pacific region, um, looking at the vulnerability of the tropical Pacific fisheries and aquaculture and importantly the ecosystems that support them to climate change. And what we've got from these two large, I guess, outputs, and they involved many scientists, um, many, many specialists from all over the Pacific, including Australia, New Zealand, and different Pacific nations, was a lot of um, key or high vulnerable areas and a lot of recommendations in terms of not only further knowledge, but adaptation actions that needed to start pretty much straight away um, in Pacific nations, again, at both regional and local scales. So, that's been followed, that used, sorry, a framework that many of you will already recognise. This has come out of the IPCC third assessment report in 2001. It's a structured way to assess vulnerability using exposure, sensitivity and adaptive capacity. And it allows for you to use 70 quantitative information to really understand the cascade of effects of climate change and also to be able to isolate the source of vulnerability. And this is really key when you start to look at um, adaptation options and implementing options that you think will be most effective and targeted towards the sources of vulnerability. The information has been supplemented over the years and as many of you will know, there's just so much going on in the Pacific in the climate change world. You know, there's targeted adaptation um, workshops that at a regional scale, there's coastal fisheries management at a regional scale, there's very specific um, resilience programs happening at very local sort of village levels. There's regional assessments of ocean acidification on its own. There's all sorts of cooperative agencies that are looking to tackle, you know, conservation of marine resources, fisheries, aquaculture, and obviously, you know, with tuna being the biggest game in town, there's a lot of focus on tuna fisheries and cooperative management. And a lot of this information is, over the years, is what we're drawing on. When we do the assessments, but also when we start to look at adaptation actions, and importantly, implementing adaptation actions. You know, there needs to be a sound basis for it, and obviously donor agencies want to fund things that are based not only on sound information, but on a regional structure. They want to see where it fits within regional management, policy and planning. So this has been a really important part, I guess, of what I'll talk to you with these case studies. This underpins a lot of it. For those who aren't familiar, I know most of you are, but the Pacific is a really large area. Um, it actually covers 22 nations, and these are countries and territories, that have exclusive economic zones of about 27 million square kilometres. Only about 2% of that is land, and that's the islands and atolls that you know, are so iconic of the Pacific, but obviously really they're large ocean states. Much of their natural resources for these Pacific nations are what lies in their marine environment. And they're also geographically isolated and quite remote, many of them. You know, you think of those large atoll nations, Kiribati, French Polynesia, they're really extensive, they've got very dispersed populations that are decentralised and they can be very isolated and difficult to reach. And this obviously has implications when we start talking about adaptation to climate change. As a result of obviously being these large ocean states, they're critically dependent on their marine resources for food, for livelihoods, for economic development, for government revenue, for so many things. And uh, you know, that obviously again is, is going to make adaptation of marine resources critically important. And as we found with the regional assessment, they're highly exposed and vulnerable to climate change. So that's the map of the area when I talk about the tropical Pacific for the rest of this talk, but that's the area I'm roughly talking about, 22 um, Pacific Island countries and territories, representing different cultural backgrounds and very diverse ecosystems. So with this approach of trying to look at what climate change means for the ecosystems, the habitats, the fisheries and the people that depend on them, it's a cascade of effects, if you like. So you've got changes happening in the Pacific Ocean as well as the atmosphere that have direct impacts on habitats as well as some direct impacts on tuna and coastal fisheries and aquaculture. 
But it's also there's some indirect effects. So changes to the habitat have significant consequences for the fisheries themselves. And then there's also secondary um, cascading effects down to the people. So the economic implications of food security and livelihoods. And so trying to tease all that out, trying to understand, like I said, this source of vulnerability to inform adaptation is really important. So you know um, how that you are actually implementing effective targeted actions. So the first case study I want to talk about is focused on food security. It's the first one because in a lot of ways that is what's critically important when we talk about the Pacific and the marine environment. Um, rural communities get up to 90% of their animal protein from um, reef fish and invertebrates. And the annual catch is estimated to be about 86,000 tonnes. That's just an estimate because about 7% of that is subsistence, which means we don't have good records. There isn't really subsistence monitoring of catch happening in any of the Pacific nations, certainly nothing comprehensive. And that 86,000 tonnes is actually likely to be an underestimate of what's being caught from reefs. And it's not just reefs, it's seagrass and mangrove areas, that mosaic of coastal habitats, pretty much within a kilometre of the coast. So it's a really small area of the whole Pacific region. About 30% of what's caught um, in nearshore areas actually is nearshore pelagic species, so tuna, wahoo, uh, mackerel. And there's also a really small portion of invertebrates that are harvested for food, like clams, and um, for export, so bestemur and trochus that are really high value going into the Asian markets. <clears throat> so if we put that in a global context, um, this is a map that FAO have put together some years ago about the global consumption of fish for food. And these colours at the bottom represent how much, how many kilos of fish each person each eats each year. You can see that over 60 kilograms per person per year is black, and really only Greenland comes up as black. The bulk of you know, the global population eats between 10 and 30 kilograms per person per year. Whereas in the Pacific, it's about three to five times higher than this global average, with <coughs> numbers up to you know, 98 to 147 kilograms per person per year. So significantly more, and you know, this map's very Europe and Africa centric, but certainly the Pacific Islands, if they could be in focus in this map, would be black and would be the highest almost that you would see on, in the whole world. To give some numbers to that, so what we have here is some of the Pacific nations in the left-hand column. The percentage of their animal protein they get from fish and invertebrates, reef fish and invertebrates, their subsistence catch and their per capita fish consumption. And you can see that countries like Federated States of Micronesia and Kiribati are eating 67 to 77 kilos per year per person. You know, French Polynesia, 90 kilograms, and you know, Tuvalu in rural areas, 147 kilograms. So significantly more than the global average and up to 90% of their protein, like I've said, from fish and invertebrates. <clears throat> the habitat declines that are projected because of climate change are one of the <coughs> primary things that are gonna change coastal fisheries um, with you know, projections of reduced coral calcification by 10% by the end of the century, losses of coral cover, seagrass area and mangrove areas. So all those habitats that support coastal fisheries are projected to decline under climate change with obvious consequences for the fisheries themselves. So here's some work done by Morgan Pratchett and Johan Bell and others that I was a part of looking at what does this mean for the actual productivity of coastal fisheries if habitats decline plus other um, climate change implications like increasing sea surface temperature. And you can see that even Western and Eastern Pacific are different, but all parts of the Pacific are projected to have declines in coastal fisheries production. Um, the Western Pacific's most pronounced with you know, up to 20% by mid-century and 35% by the end of the century. Eastern Pacific still significant 10% by mid-century and 30% by the end of the century. So obviously when you have communities that are you know, catching so much fish, are so dependent on it for food, 90% of their protein, um, this is, has serious implications um, for their food security into the future. So we did an analysis of all of this using some standard indicators in that vulnerability assessment framework and actually managed to group all of the 22 nations in the Pacific into three categories based on their food security outcomes because of population growth and climate change. And the results I'm going to show you in this slide actually are more driven, particularly in the short to medium term, by population growth. Even though climate change does kick in and exacerbate the issues about mid-century, a little bit earlier, the primary effect 
on these nations right now, on their lack of food security, if you want to call it that, is population growth. So when we start to talk about adaptation of fisheries, of marine resources, it's, it's a social issue in many cases, at least in the short term, and that is obviously maybe very challenging when you want to start implementing adaptations. So group one are those countries listed there, and they're the countries that their reefs are projected to have be large enough, produce enough fish to be able to feed their populations. Most of them actually have fairly low population growth. This is why they've ended up in group one. So even though climate change will kick in and start to affect the productivity of coastal fisheries, their populations aren't growing that quickly, so at least in the short to medium term, they're, they're going to be able to feed their people, essentially. Group two uh, are in a similar situation in the sense that they've got large enough reef areas, their populations aren't growing that fast, that they can produce enough fish, but they may have distributional issues. So again, these are these really dispersed atoll nations in many cases that simply you know, have urban centres that are a long way from where the fish has been caught. So any adaptations you might want to implement in these Group 2 countries need to focus on distribution, food, uh, fish preservation, rather than anything else. Group 3 um, countries are those listed there, and they're the ones where, <coughs> even now, their reefs are not producing enough fish to feed their, their people. And population growth, big driver of this one. You know, they are the countries that have some of the largest population growth in the Pacific. Solomon Islands, PNG, Fiji. And that's what's driving this shortfall, if you like, of fish and invertebrates for food. And they're the ones that have been identified as a high priority for adaptation. So I'm going to just focus on Vanuatu for the next part because we've been working there since 2015 on a project called Rescue. It's funded by a French aid agency and run through SPC. And there's a lot of work going on in Vanuatu to help support their food security, not just by our project, but by others and partners we work with. So some of the adaptations <coughs> focused on food security for Vanuatu um, have been that monitoring has started in 2015 on coastal habitats. So this includes reef, seagrass and mangroves. This is happening at a national level. So the Vanuatu government through the Vanuatu Fisheries Department are monitoring their coastal habitats. And we're also working with communities to support them monitor their local marine areas. So they can get a better understanding of what's happening, what's changing, and, and maybe some actions they need to take to stop those changes or, or at least slow them down. There's also a national fisheries policy that was released in 2016 and um, there's regulations we're told to follow this year. If those regulations come out, that would be the first country almost in the Pacific to have regulations for coastal fisheries. Because they're largely subsistence, very difficult to monitor, difficult to manage for national, manage for national governments, this would be a bit of a first. And, um, Dave Welch, who's part of that project in the back of the room, has actually been doing a lot of capacity building within the Vanuatu Fisheries Department to help them get those regulations right, get size limits, bag limits, whatever they want to do, um, get them happening, have an understanding of how they might be able to actually do that in the context of a resource limited um, fishery. There's been some projects trialling <laughs> solar dryers to improve um, preservation of fish. Uh, so that when you get good catches in good seasons, particularly of those nearshore pelagics that come through seasonally in big numbers, you can actually preserve them for periods where your catches are really dropping and also as a disaster relief effort. When Tropical Cyclone Pan went through in 2015, food and water were the two things that people just didn't have. So being able to implement some sort of food preservation that is effective is a, is a good um, response to things like increasing you know, cyclone intensity coming through. There's also been some new freshwater pond aquaculture for tilapia put in some villages and some poultry packs, so little chicken packs, if you like, released around different villages. This is an initiative being led by GIZ and the German Aid Agency. And, uh, you know, that's an alternative source of protein, trying to take the pressure off reef fish, given that 90% of the animal protein comes from fish and invertebrates, but trying to just shift that a little bit so they don't need to fish as often. There's some real cultural barriers to this working and it hasn't been entirely effective in every village, but again, it's that <coughs> alternative to using reef fish and invertebrates. And um, some work that's being done um, with world fish and others to transfer again fishing effort away from reefs into these nearshore pelagic species using fish aggregating devices. There's a local design, it's called a vaituka, um, loosely translate to fish and wealth. 
And there's now a network of over 30 of these fads that have been installed or in some cases reinstalled after the cyclone since 2014. With the idea that they're near shore, they can be reached by a paddle canoe and they're not for industrial commercial fishing sector, they're primarily for subsistence community access. Um, they use all local materials, they're largely subsurface. They actually fared better in the cyclone than the more western design with concrete blocks and you know shackles and things. And uh, they are actually quite popular. I think fishermen would rather go to a niche or fat and still catch a fish than go tend to a chicken because they're not a farmer, they're a fisherman. So this culturally is more acceptable than things like the poultry packs or the tilapia ponds. So in terms of the monitoring, and this is the second case study I want to talk about, I said we've been working closely with communities to develop their monitoring capacity and help them monitor their local resources. And uh, this is because, as I said, in the regional assessment, coastal habitats were identified as highly vulnerable, which obviously means it's going to have implications for fisheries and the reef dependent communities that rely on them for food and income. We've already seen consecutive climate driven impacts in Vanuatu uh, and they are affecting reef condition. They've had the tropical cyclone and El Nino um, drought and also some coral bleaching when there was global bleaching happening everywhere. So there are changes happening and local communities want to understand those and, and want to be able to make management decisions with a better understanding. Um, we also know that even though at a national level there's more monitoring happening, they can't possibly get everywhere. You know, not just Vanuatu, many Pacific nations are very large, very dispersed, like I said. You know, Vanuatu has over 300 islands over a very large area. So it's really important that local communities are empowered to do their own monitoring and management. There's also obviously a lot of traditional management already. So a better understanding is always going to make that traditional management, you know, better. So the projected changes to reefs um, under RCP 8.5, so a high emission scenario um, for 2035, 2050 and 2100 were declines across all fronts in terms of coral cover. So even though we looked at both strong and poor management, thinking that maybe under strong management you build reef resilience, you'll see um, you, know, you might not have a decline in coral cover, there's still declines projected. Um, you know, even under strong management in the medium term, 2035, uh, 25 to 65% decrease in coral cover. And we're already seeing this obviously here in GBR throughout the Pacific. So management's important, but at the end of the day it is going to decline and this is why we need to start considering um, adaptation options while still advocating obviously for greenhouse gas emission mitigation. Macroalgae cover is projected to increase in the medium as well as the long term under both, again, strong and weak management, which is, I guess, what everyone would expect. And, you know, looking at up to 90% loss of coral cover or maybe even more by the end of the century. Similar story, but not quite as pronounced for mangroves and seagrass. So, you know, we know there's about 25 square kilometres of mangroves in Vanuatu, not so sure of the figure for seagrass, but both of them are projected to decline in area in the medium as well as the long term. And this is again under a high emissions scenario. And obviously we're losing these habitats, implications for the fish and vertebrates they support and the people that depend on them. As I said, we've had recent events in Vanuatu. There was a, pa a cyclone pan that went through in March 2015, the El Nino drought in 1516 Austral summer. And then there was a marine heat wave in 2016 that was felt you know, everywhere throughout the Pacific, the globe. And Australia as well, and uh, there was coral bleaching in 2016. Uh, we did monitor that, and, and fortunately, in the course of two weeks of monitoring, um, when the waters cooled down, there was almost total recovery. So Vanuatu certainly fared a lot better than many other places. So this is some of the monitoring data from our project site in North Afate, which is the main island, and that's where we're working primarily. Our monitoring started in 2015 after Tropical Cyclone Pan. But there is some data going back to 1989. It's AIMS monitoring data. It's not using their long-term monitoring protocol, unfortunately, and it is only a limited number of sites. So I guess you know we would take it perhaps with a grain of salt, but it still gives an indication of what was happening over 20 years ago on the reefs in North Afate with about 20% coral cover averaged across all, all sites. Um, in 2004, Reef Check started monitoring and I 
I'm very suspicious of that figure of 67% coral cover in 2004. I think there are some amazing <coughs> sites in North Afate. There are some sites that have almost 100% coral cover even to this day. And I think they may have been cherry picking those sites when they did those surveys. So I am a little bit suspicious. Um, you can see obviously that that coral cover has never been that high since or before then. And uh, it had, had a significant decline from about 2005 onwards when they had a Cranathorn starfish outbreak. It had, they had never seen Cranathorn starfish outbreaks before about 2005. And uh, it was a, a massive issue then. They lost obviously a lot of coral because of the cots and they'd actually instigated a cots control program which is still going to this day. So local tourism operators working with the Vanuatu Fisheries Department have a control program where they go out and inject them with lime juice. And they also have an online reporting system. If they're observed by anyone and they're reported, they'll go verify and then um, inject them. So they feel like they're on top of it. Anecdotally, they feel like they've controlled the, and it's a fairly small area. It's nothing like the scale of the Great Barrier Reef, obviously. But um, certainly since about 2008 you know, onwards, nine, they've seen increases in coral cover and they very much feel that controlling cots has been a big part of that improvement in reefs. Unfortunately, in 2015, Tropical Cyclone Pam went through and we surveyed literally the two months after that and we could see the damage, um, quite extensive damage and you know, coral cover still though was just under 30%. So some sites were very trashed, but on average for the whole of the area, it wasn't too bad. There's been a lot of recovery since then. Um, 2016, as I said, there was bleaching, quite extensive, but almost total recovery. And at the moment, when we did our surveys last year, we're looking at about 35% coral cover. So it's a reasonably healthy area, but very dynamic, obviously, already experiencing a lot of um, impacts, climate-driven impacts in some cases, and communities want to understand this better. They want to understand what's happening in their local area and make management decisions based on what's happening. So in 2015, we started talking to two community networks that work, that operate in that area, Tassi Vanua and Nuna Pele. They're environmental resource networks. They're very active, it's mostly voluntary, and, and it's amazing what they can achieve um, with mostly voluntary networks. They acknowledge that they do manage their local resources. I mean, they have a lot of traditional <coughs> management, a lot of custom law. They have these taboo or, or closed areas managed by the village chief. And, but they felt that they didn't have the monitoring or the information to make good decisions, that a lot of decisions were just made based on you know, intuition or money or other things without actually knowing what's happening out there. So they wanted some monitoring. They had been taught monitoring techniques in the past, but they felt they were too complex and always the data had to go away to be analysed before they got the results and in many cases they never got the results back. So they didn't feel that it was actually useful to make their decisions. And they also recognised that they didn't have management objectives. So, you know, managing something without monitoring, without objectives, you know, just wasn't going to work. So that's what we focused on in the project and um, helping them try and address some of these. So we developed a community-based marine monitoring toolkit with the two networks and the Vanuatu Fisheries Department. And we've been field testing it for, well, over 18 months now with 27 communities in North Afate. Um, the monitoring and the training is led by marine champions. So these are people from the communities, from the environmental resource networks who have an interest in their <coughs> environment, may have done monitoring in the past and are willing and able to lead their community in doing monitoring and also training them. And they're really capable trainers now, you know, almost two years on, they can train in English, Bislam or French. They are really um, progressing quite well and becoming future leaders in their communities. So the nine objectives they came up with when we went, we, we sort of facilitated this process, but this is the communities and the network's objectives. Um, they're listed up there on the board. Some of them, I guess, would be standard if you went into almost any community anywhere, you know, conserve for future generations, control over harvest. There were some interesting ones in there though, like obey national laws and regulations, and you know, have tourist attractions for income. You know, there were some things perhaps that we weren't expecting, but the idea is that these are how you would target your monitoring. If you're managing for these objectives, your monitoring then is based on, are we reaching our objectives? Are we working towards them successfully or are we not? And then what do we need to adjust? So we have these 14 marine champions who have really helped implement this the whole way along. Um, they've come a long way, like I said, in, in two years. They're now fully recognised in their communities 
they're quite well known. Two of them have got into um, higher learning, fully funded um, courses on climate change. One of them has been elected to provincial government. They really are key to this being successful because we're not there all the time. They now drive the monitoring, the training, and all the awareness raising that's happening in, their tw in the 27 villages. So the toolkit was designed to be really simple, yet robust. So this has been such a fine line to walk. You know, we got the message from communities that it was complex and we couldn't analyse the data. And then you get the message from the national government that communities can't collect data that's useful for, for national decisions, so it's rubbish. So you have to walk that fine line between being able to do the monitoring effectively and understand it, and having information that's useful and robust for the government. And I mean, we feel like we've achieved it. There's been a team of us doing this, myself, Dave Welch, Jane Waterhouse from Trotwater, and a couple of people from New Zealand. And uh, you know, I've got a copy of the toolkit here if anyone wants to look at it. But we feel like we've, we've found that balance between simple but robust. Um, it has empowered communities to manage their local resources better. When we got there, they had taboo areas that were supposed to be closed that were actually open. They had taboo areas that were supposed to be closed uh, permanently that they used to open every second week because people were hungry or they had a ceremony. And it's been really variable management. And we do feel like there's a definitely more interest, not that things have totally changed, not that takes time, but there's definitely more interest to manage their resources in a more sustainable way. It's also an early warning for impacts. It was the communities that first started to notice the coral bleaching in 2016. You know, they're the eyes and ears on the ground. Citizen science, as we know, is effective throughout the world because they're there all the time. They're either fishing or they've got their heads in the water. Spear, a lot of spear fishing happens there, a lot of reef walking. And you know, you simply can't have national initiatives everywhere, operating everywhere. So they're really important early warning. A real benefit has been the awareness raising. You know, within communities that had leaders or chiefs that weren't that concerned about their environment, that was more about just feeding, you know, has everyone got enough food, has everyone got enough money, can we make more income from a marine environment? It really has changed some of the awareness about their environment and their environmental issues. And that's growing and this is, you know, really exciting, I think. Um, it also now can provide a source of data for government. So walking that fine balance between simple and robust, we've actually now got Vanuatu Fisheries Department wanting to use the fish catch data. You know, there isn't much subsistence data around, so um, you know, we've adjusted the fish catch module over and over again, and Dave's worked closely with the fisheries department so that they can now take that data and help it inform their regulations when they come in place. And it's really flexible, so it allows communities to choose modules. So I keep saying this word modules oh, and the champions of future leader. So what do I mean by modules? So that's the toolkit, six modules. Fish catch is the first one, intertidal invertebrates, reef, mangroves, seagrass, and then finally crown of thorns starfish. And the whole idea is each of these are independent. While they follow the same model, the same framework, once you get trained in them, it's really clear that they you know, have the same stepwise process. They are all independent. So communities can do only one, they can do all six, they can do three. It doesn't matter how many they choose. It's meant to be tailored to what their issues are and what their needs at a community level are. And so that way it's really flexible. We want it to be flexible because in the past, again, while monitoring has failed, is they've been told you must monitor this, you must do it then, you must do this. It doesn't work, people just lose interest. In the toolkit, we have a quick field guide. So I've again got some of these up the front, one for each module. It's just something to help them work through site selection, collecting the data, what method you use, how you record the data and then how you use it immediately to report back to leaders, chiefs, community to help decision making. Um, the data reporting sheet again is a reporting tool so the data can go right back into the community straight away. They have a field sheet, it transposes directly into a data reporting sheet which then can be used for discussion purposes with the chief and the village. And in that data reporting sheet there's pre-agreed actions. If we see an issue, what are the actions we're prepared to take to address that issue? It's pre-agreed before they start monitoring so there's no disputes once the results come in. And they can go up on a community notice board or whatever so everyone can go back and see what's happening in their own local area. In terms of choosing modules, this is sort of guidance we've given villages, it's totally up to them, but you know, things like what are your key local issues? So you're noticing habitat damage or loss, 
Are you not catching as many fish? Are there no sea cucumbers for you to harvest when you go out there? Has there been a recent impact, that sort of thing? Do you want to open a new, or close a new taboo area? All what species or habitats of concern? And as I said, obviously totally flexible, six modules, they can choose one, they can choose three, they can choose as many as is they have time for and, and the interest in doing. So, so far in Vanuatu, there's been um, six community monitoring days led by the champions. So that means they have off their own bat organised a day for their community to come together, do some awareness raising, discuss their local environment and issues, discuss the monitoring, and then go out together as a village and actually monitor their local environment. There's also been three village school days. So again, champions have led these, two of them with primary schools, one with high schools. They've got the children in, they've actually done some awareness raising and then they've gone out and collected some monitoring data. There is also regular monitoring by the resource monitors. There's the 14 marine champions. We've also, they've also trained up a further 47 resource monitors in 27 villages. And there's data sharing arrangements currently being progressed with the fisheries department to use the catch data in particular and also data storage, which is a nightmare. Um, so it's been really successful. It's been driven by communities. It's meeting their needs while also trying to be robust and meet national needs. You know, and we've had, like I said, these real successes where off their own bat they've organised community days where they've had a march, an opening prayer by the chief, and then they all go out and collect data. So it's, um, the uptake is increasing and um, we've had interest also from other countries like Fiji and French Polynesia um, for the toolkit, which would need to be tailored, but yeah, it has real utility. So now I'm going to change tack totally and talk a bit about livelihoods. Um, again, marine environment, hugely important, big area, provides a lot of income, particularly for remote and regional um, communities. 47% of coastal households get their first or second income from the marine environment, particularly reef fisheries. That's regional data, but it applies at a national level, um, you know, within that range. In the Solomon Islands, so the project I'm going to talk about here is in the Solomon Islands. It's funded by USAID under PACM, and it's a partnership with World Fish and the Solomon Islands Community Conservation Partnership. Um, the rural communities there rely on not only in the marine resources, but also as we've gone along, because it's a climate change project, they've brought up some of their other resources that they use for income like cassava and banana. So we've now had to roll in both sort of land and sea considerations when we talk about adaptation. And there's also been some new income generating opportunities that they've identified as they're noticing climate changes. So with increasing temperatures, they've actually noticed that gnarly nut, which is an export product for Solomon Islands, they're getting a double harvest in one year. So where they used to harvest only in March, they're now getting a January and a March harvest. So that's an income opportunity. So trying to work with communities to use this information that we know about what climate change means, what they're relying on for income, and what is you know, projected to change, how they can help adapt to all of that and actually maximise those benefits. So we did a participatory adaptation planning process with two villages in Rondover in Western Province, Solomon Islands, where we worked with the women and men separately because the women talk better when the men aren't in the room and uh, asked them all about their local environment, their villages, what they use, what they need for income, for food, for their well-being, for their medicines, for their children, for their culture, and what changes they've noticed. And then we talked to them about climate change, did some awareness raising, and then asked them what they thought that would mean for all these things that are important to them for livelihoods and what they might want to do to either minimise the impact or maximise the benefits. So we did things, and many of you may have seen these seasonal calendars where they draw when they harvest, when they catch certain fish, when the turtles come into nest, when the wind blows, when the rain falls, you know, all the different things that drives their, their livelihoods and also their food in a, on a daily basis around the course of a year. So each of those pieces of pie is a month, going obviously from January, the J up the top there around to December, and they draw all the things that happen during the course of a year. And then we ask them what's changed. Have they noticed changes? And the more elders you have in the room, the more information you get there. So we've had you know, elders in the room and we get information for how it was 30 years ago and 40 years ago. And all the changes they're noticing in the season that fish come in, that the turtles are nesting, all those sorts of things, crops. And that obviously has implications again for their livelihoods and their food. And then we get them to draw 
their values, what are the things they use, what's important to them again for their income, their food, their well-being, their medicines, their culture, and how is that changing? And then we talk about climate change and the projections, and then ask them how do they think it will continue to change. And ultimately what we end up with is an adaptation plan, and this is just a small portion of that just to show some of the key resources that are you know, highly vulnerable to climate change. So reefs and fish, turtles, garden crops, beaches and shorelines. The source of the vulnerability. So again, really important. So there's a lot of background work that happens outside of the community discussions about why are these resources vulnerable and what they think it will mean. You know, we get them to think, well, what, how will that change your crops, your fishing, your turtle nesting? And then some adaptations, and this is all from them. So you can see, without much prompting, they talk about you know reef protection, fisheries harvest controls, turtle nesting programs, turtle management and conservation. So they're identifying the things they want to do, and this project's now in the implementation phase. So they're getting assistance to get the skills or the equipment or whatever they need to start implementing these adaptations to protect the things that are important for their livelihoods and also their food security. And when we talk about communities, obviously um, community resilience is a, is a really generalised term and we hear it a lot and it's bandied around a lot. But I guess this project started out, just to tell you, it's a project in the South Fly of Papua New Guinea. It's basically on Australia's borderlands. You know, it's four kilometres from Saibai and Borgu, the northernmost islands of Torres Strait, you can see them. And they are definitely closer to Australia than they are to any sort of major centres in Papua New Guinea. And this project started out as a conservation project. The idea was to go in and talk to communities about their turtle and dugong management and their sustainable marine resources. But when we went in there and saw what was going on, we had to do a major readjustment and actually put that on the back burner, if you like, and deal with immediate community social issues before we could start talking about environmental issues. So the area is extremely isolated. There's 13 villages along that southern coast of PNG um, and they are four hours by boat from Daru, which is the closest PNG centre. They're very close to Saibai and Boigu, but they don't have full access to those Australian islands. Their human development index is 0.26. So to give you some context, that's second in the whole world to the Congo. So if the South Fly was a country all of its own right, it would be second to the Congo in terms of poverty, in terms of disease, in terms of social issues. Um, and they are highly exposed to climate variability and change. They're already seeing impacts of things like drought, more extreme rainfall, greater inundation um, of salt water, those sorts of things. So they're already seeing impacts. So as I said, this has caused a lot of challenges and, and we simply could not talk about turtle and dugong management or environmental conservation when people don't have clean water to drink, don't have sanitation, they've got TB, malaria, they are you know, not getting food from their fisheries because they're declining. They've got one of the largest population growth issues in PNG, 5.6 children per woman. Per woman. And um, they're very isolated remote and they have no income opportunities. They have no access to markets, no trade. They're not allowed to trade with Australia because of biosecurity. They're too far from any centre or market in PNG. So we, we changed tax, like I said, and we're now dealing with this whole intricate you know, set of issues in, and now only three years in starting to tackle conservation and environmental issues. So all of these cross-cutting issues um, couldn't be separated. Many of them are related to environmental and, and climate change um, pressures, but you know we've gone in, I guess, initially with a community resilience agenda, talking about building their resilience, building their well-being, and then you know we're slowly introducing environmental concepts. So we have a ranger program, um, which, like I said, is about building a resilience platform to adapt to climate change, working with 13 treaty villages. Um, these are the first set of graduates, 52 rangers from four villages. We've now got 58 more rangers in training from the remaining um, seven villages, and they'll graduate later this year. And they are from their communities. They're nominated by the leaders of the communities. They go back and work in the communities, take their skills and knowledge back to their communities. And they do things like clean water and sanitation, community health, food security, primarily focused around new drought resistant cultivars and different fishing practices and food preservation techniques 
disaster risk reduction, livelihoods and wellbeing, and then obviously governance <coughs> and leadership. And you know, the aim is to build future leaders in these communities so that they can maintain a um, better social and environmental environment to live in. So this is just some of the things. There's food dryers, <coughs> fish dryers, some plumbing. They've put in a lot of rain capture and storage tanks. Um, there's been TB awareness. We've partnered with Space and Picamini to do contraception and reproductive health. I mean, it's just things you never imagine you'd do as environmental scientists, but you do it because it, there's just no way you can talk about anything conservation-wise if you don't address these underlying issues and people don't have clean water and food and, and health. And lastly, we're doing a, a rapid tour of the Pacific. I just want to give some snippets <coughs> and case studies, and I'm happy to talk about any of these in more detail later. Um, a project that we did for SPRET looking at ocean acidification specifically on a regional scale and what it means for reef dependent communities within all 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. So we started with the projections of you know, declining pH under a high emissions scenario, so 0.3 units by mid-century, um, what that meant for aragonite saturation, so declining to 3 to 3.5, which is marginal for calcification of corals and some invertebrates with shells and uh, the significant biological implications of this. And this was a starting point for the assessment in this project. And then what we wanted to do is translate it, what that meant for the reef goods and services that people depend on, for their food income and again, coastal protection. So exposure was a factor of their reef habitat, how that was projected to decline, decline because of ocean acidification and reduced calcification rates, and the reef fisheries declines by 2050, um, their sensitivity to these declines in food security and livelihoods, so that's essentially a measure of their dependence on, on reefs for, for food and income, and their adaptive capacity based on a set of um, standard indicators, health, environment, education, governance and economy size. And what we found were the six most vulnerable nations, which are on this table on the left, are listed there, and the source of their vulnerability. So we assessed all 22 nations and primarily reef dependent communities and identified their source of vulnerability. And again, this is important so you know that if you are going to start doing adaptations, they're targeting the right thing and they're most likely to be effective. And um, you know, a lot of those are countries that have very large reef areas or have um, you know, very dependent, high dependence on their reefs. But some of the common drivers of vulnerability to ocean acidification were, again, large reef areas of a nation, high household income dependence on reefs, um, poor governance, that's both local and national, and small national economies, so they really couldn't compensate if there was a loss of something, um, that, you know, some commodity from the reef. Um, and interestingly, the top three most vulnerable nations came from Micronesia. But again, it's these you know, atoll nations with large reef areas and fairly small national economies. So that information is now being used by SPREP to do some um, adaptations. Uh, first of all, they've got some demonstration sites look at local buffering of ocean acidification. <coughs> Their demonstration sites are only in Vanuatu and Kiribati. But the hope is down the track when we get a better spatial understanding of how pH is projected to change in the Pacific, they can be targeted to areas where pH is changing faster or is already um, quite low. So that project with the demonstration sites actually coupled with some additional monitoring being put in place just last year by NOAA and the University of South Pacific, trying to get this spatial resolution on pH with the hope that they can start to target, target these buffering projects. Now the buffering projects at this point are focusing on seaweed farming and seagrass replanting, but um, there is talk of some other projects as well in place. But certainly when we start to think of French Polynesia, really high um, income dependence, jobs and government revenue on um, pearls, they, you know, they're talking about now trying to do pearl and seaweed farming together. So that's that local buffering that can protect a particularly valuable industry at that scale. There's some other adaptations being talked about but haven't started yet. So this is just standard ones, you know, improving reef resilience so it copes better with the pH changes. Diversifying livelihoods away from these really vulnerable resources. So, you know, if you're reef tourism, maybe looking at island or village tourism. If you're pearl farming, maybe look at seaweed farming or co-farming, this sort of buffering approach. 
Um, shifting away from reef fisheries, so again, similar to the food security story, you know, targeting those nearshore pelagic species and supporting local and national governance. Again, you know, these are the standard ones just to address these key vulnerabilities. Um, so this is just a snippet, I guess, a random tour of the Pacific and some of the projects that are, you know, using the information we have, the science that we have, to really try and inform some on-ground practical adaptations. And it is a vast place, it is mostly ocean, and marine resources are critically important. So, you know, adaptation is key, um, but it obviously needs to be coupled with some other things that, you know, sometimes are unpalatable, like population control and climate change, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So thank you. Mm -hmm.